We believe that good is something positive. Yet we are not too sure exactly what good is. What is true, absolute, abstract goodness? Not being very certain as to what is good, we must try to philosophize on it a little bit. Along in religion, good may be considered under several different types of thinking. If the word good is capitalized, it generally is a synonym for God. And Socrates divided the basic triad of primary nature, a primary being, into the one, the beautiful, and the good. Good, therefore, stands for absolute virtue. It, stand, it stands for absolute integrity, for all the things which are best, for all conditions, powers, forces, and circumstances that arise in the best and perpetuate the best or move inevitably toward the accomplishment of that which is best. Not capitalized, good means the condition of being without sin. It means to be abundant in the natural, simple virtues of mankind. So we have commandments given to us, like the Decalogue, by which the measurement of the good life is more or less created into a code or a system. We are given certain commandments, and the commandments of the Old Testament are amplified by the two of the New Testament. So that the final commandments, perhaps, for Christendom are that we shall love God with all our hearts and our brothers as ourselves. These constitute the highest concept of the good life. The good life is the useful life, the unselfish life, the kind life, the generous, sympathetic, understanding life. The good life is one in which the person uh, becomes a source of good to others, defending good, advancing it, supporting it, and protecting it. A good life is also one in which the person can look back upon a life in which his own conscience has not been outraged by his conduct. He knows he will not be and cannot be perfect, but a good life is one in which he feels that the good things he has done overbalance the mistakes that he has made. Well, this is the case, the pious person of old felt that he might face his maker with a good heart and a good hope. Goodness also has to do with common good, with laws, with statutes, with institutions established for the improvement and betterment of mankind. Good is peace, order lawfulness. Good is community existence on a cooperative basis. Good represents also security for the individual, his family, his world. And it is assumed that where we live in a generation of comparative peace, uh, where our industry is reasonably rewarded, where we have the security of a quiet, private life uh, held within the common social bonds of decency, that these are good times in which to live. Now, there are some who are more interested in active attitudes and estimations. To them, good is progress. To them, good is anything which makes life better for man. So, good brings into, our, into its a fold creative artistry, science, uh, medicine, law, engineering, everything that may be regarded as contributing to the security and improvement of mankind as a whole. So we can think of good as all that helps, and we can think of it as beginning with the divine all which, which helps everything 
and come down to the private type of help which we can bestow upon each other. The good man is therefore an honest man who pays his bills, whose word is his bond, who lives charitably and generously, who is a friend to his friend, who has no enemies, who practices uh, the benevolences regarded as essential by his religion. If he is not a religious person, as may be the case today, he may also achieve a certain measure of good. He then lives ethically, he lives morally, he lives uh, creatively within the span of good taste, within the pattern of that which is obviously the common good. And he can still have all the benevolences and ideals of popular service and public welfare, whether he be strongly religious or not. But it is more difficult for him, perhaps, to sustain himself in critical periods if he has no sense of eternal value locked within his own consciousness. Now, as opposed to this good, we have all that we may consider to be evil. Evil is not something that is absolutely and clearly distinct from good. Evil is as though it were a shadow cast by good. As, uh, as soon as man attempts something creative, something idealistic, the adversary seems to rise out of nature to oppose him. The person, therefore, who tries to be better than his time is penalized by his time. The individual who tries to be honorable among those less honorable will again be penalized, exploited, and hurt. The person who tries to live a gentle, kindly Christian life in these days will be subjected to constant pressure, will be forced uh, to compromise his principles or else experience many kinds of failures and reverses. So it will, it will appear in some mysterious way that good and evil are linked together. The individual who does not attempt to be better and seldom experiences the pressures uh, that uh, come to those who make a legitimate and honorable claim uh, to integrity. Uh, it would appear then also that good contains within it always the possibility of its own abuse. And what we call evil must be considered uh, in this light. Most philosophy and uh, many of the more enlightened religions of antiquity simply rejected empirically uh, the ex existence of an evil principle in the universe. They refused to believe that a deity could at the same time be supreme and be the victim of the conspiracy of an adversary. This question was brought to Buddha on one occasion by the Brahmins who tried to trick him into a commitment much as the Pharisees tried to commit uh, Jesus to a statement on the on the head on Caesar's penny. The answer that Buddha gave to the question as to whether deity uh, permits good and evil to exist, whether deity uh, is the source of both good and evil. Uh, Buddha answered very simply, if God does not prevent evil, he is not good. If God cannot prevent evil, he is not God. And the Burmans went away and could not answer him. And this is very largely the philosophic point of view in both the East and the West, that the concept of a supreme principle must imply that this principle is good. We cannot join a few like the Yezids of Iraq who settled down to the quiet process of devil worship. We cannot afford in our own consciousness to assume that the universe is governed by evil. But we must assume that the universe is governed by something. And whatever that something is, it cannot be divided against itself. 
the universe cannot be maintained unless there is a supreme power that guides its ultimate destiny. The house divided against itself cannot stand. And a creation divided against itself could not survive as this has, has for uncounted billions of years. I don't mean the earth, I mean the vast pageantry of existence. Consequently, all thoughtful, all wise and kindly people have come finally to the conclusion that the universe is essentially the production of what we would like to term good. Here, perhaps, however, we have made a mistake. We have taken two terms which oppose each other and assisted the balance or have caused a situation by applying one of these terms to a supreme power, which in this way almost forces us to attribute the other term to a power of equal magnitude. So the philosophers finally came to the conclusion that good and evil, as we use these terms, are both of them uh, inadequate to express the nature of the original state of being. The universe was therefore regarded as a state of existence. This existence superior to both good and evil as we know these terms. This existence subsisting forever according to its own nature, this nature being absolute and infinite. This nature has to be lawful, has to be all-powerful and inevitable. And the manifestation of this power cannot be polarized in its basic existence. This power must be one inevitable, immutable reality. This reality, however, is known to us by means of a comparative faculty within our own natures. This comparative faculty being established in the mind or being more or less the mental life of man. Research indicates that man, developing a mental life, can only do so by the use of a polarized concept. Man must think in the either-or patterns. He may attempt to develop a non-Aristotelian theory, but ultimately he comes back to comparison. Man compares. And the concept of good and evil, therefore, as we know it, has to arise in man. It has to arise in the very creature that has found words to express it. And in every language, man has found words to express the concept of good and evil. Man, however, has no absolute knowledge of either. He cannot positively define absolute good, nor absolute evil. He cannot know with complete certainty whether any, whether any incident that occurs to him is good or evil. He thinks he can. But every so often his best interpretations prove to be inadequate. The man who stands on the railroad platform, cursing his ill luck at having missed the train, does not know that the train will be wrecked, and the fact that he missed it was the most fortunate thing that could happen to him. It is only later that what he regarded as a minor disaster proved to be a great blessing. There are occasions every day in which we are forced to revise our own interpretations of things. So perhaps we can go back to the Greeks and also to the Egyptians, who finally came to the conclusion that good and evil are man's ways of attempting to define the impact of infinite life upon himself. It's the same problem with the stars. Are there evil stars? 
are there good or evil aspects? Or are these very highly speculative terms? Man unable to know the infinite in its own nature, except perhaps a few very highly illuminated mystics who have gone a little further than the average mortal in this research. For the most part, man's idea of good and evil is all based upon certain reactions which arise in himself. Though it is true that men can be better or worse, that we cannot say that good and evil necessarily exclusively arise within the person, but they do arise within the collective which we call humanity itself. We cannot term natural phenomena actually either good or evil in itself any more than we can uh, determine the moral quality of the divine will. Natural occurrences arise of themselves. They have to be accepted. But the fact that they arise does not make them good or evil. Because to be good or evil, the storm would have to have the choice. The storm would have to choose to be a storm, which is not true. Therefore, the minglings and chemistries of nature cannot be determined by the code of good or evil. We deny the right of good or evil to any creature without a mind. Consequently, we cannot imagine our little dog as a sinner because he bites the postman. It is bad judgment, bad taste, and perhaps bad flavor, but at the same time, the dog cannot be held guilty of sin. For we do not recognize that the animal is capable of moral decision. It is the follower of natural instincts of its own kind. Men have injured animals for ages, and animals fear man as a result. So that this cannot be held to be a true evidence of good and evil. What we are really saying is, therefore, that good and evil cannot exist unless the being in which they arise is capable of reacting to either. An individual cannot be good unless he has chosen to be good in the presence of an opportunity not to be good. An individual cannot be evil unless in the presence of choice between good and evil he has chosen evil. It is his choice, therefore, voluntarily made, which causes him to have merit or demerit. In the same way, we do not consider small children accountable to law, because until we regard them as old enough to understand, we cannot hold them guilty of action. Thus, the problem of good and evil lies in understanding. It lies in some recognition by which the being, uh, supported in his choice by at least a limited individualism, a capability for choice, this individual must choose, and by his choice he is good or bad. If this is true, then what is the relationship of good and bad to the universe itself? The answer is that there is no essential relationship. That good and bad simply arise in conditioned existence. If there was no man or no other creature possessing faculties of decision in the universe, then good and bad could not exist. But if there is a creature arising anywhere in whom these faculties are developed, then when that creature reaches a point of self-determinism, good and bad are simultaneously launched upon his awareness. So there we can then come perhaps a little to the oriental point of view, that in these things man is 
casting the reflection of himself upon space. Man talks of a good God and an evil uh, agent, a demon. What he is actually doing, however, is projecting his own dual nature upon space and insisting that space itself is the source of his duality. Is this essentially true? Is space responsible for the good-bad condition that we know? The ancients did not feel so. They thought that good and bad were matters of adjustment, that good and bad had to do with ways of interpreting the inevitable processes of life. The individual passing through certain experiences himself found his, his pleasures or his pains from these experiences. If these experiences pleased him, he considered them good. If they displeased him, he considered them evil. Yet in the very process of seeking his own pleasures, he fell into most of his own pain. The very process, therefore, of seeking good in term of gratification led to misery. Thus happiness and unhappiness, as Buddhism points out, must always be related to each other. The individual cannot indulge any excess of mind or emotion without reaction. Thus, theoretically, in philosophy, good can be considered action, and evil a reaction to an action which is not adequate, which is not sufficient. If the action is sufficient, if the action carries within it uh, no, Ill, no ill factor, then the consequences can also be good. Therefore, good as consequence arises from good. Evil as consequence arises from the corruption of good. Another way of looking at it was advanced by some of the early Sabians and people in the valley of the Euphrates. Uh, they took the attitude that there was a, a great chord or thread, like a musical string uniting heaven and earth. It was divided into various uh, intervals, and uh, these were marked like the frets of a, of a stringed instrument. And in this sequence of considerations, the thread extended from good to bad. And bad, in this case, was always one thing only, the least degree of good. We only had one thing. Evil, therefore, could be regarded as an ineffective degree of good, a degree of good that was not enough to accomplish very much. Even as darkness was held by some people to be the least degree of light. Uh, as good can be regarded as the greatest degree of a thing, so the least degree of that same thing, if it be essential or necessary, can be regarded as evil. This was one other way of uh, trying to solve the problem. Good and evil also arise out of relationships. The individual in the desert uh, is very anxious to have water. Uh, to him, water is the greatest good. To the drowning man, water is the greatest possible evil, unless he learns to swim at the critical moment. Thus, good and evil relate to situations. And all over the world today, there are people engaged in various activities. For them, these activities seem good. For another person, these activities do not seem good. The quiet person who has no particular desire to take on heavy responsibilities chooses a job in which routine activity will be his most common probability. This man is happy and satisfied in his work. An ambitious man captured in the same type of employment will become embittered, restless, and rebellious. 
Good, therefore, is that which produces satisfaction in the life itself. And we cannot judge one man's good entirely by the good of other people. This is one of our common daily difficulties, is that we are all trying to help other people to be happy by helping them to be the way we think they should be. We want them to share a happiness that we have found, but when we force it upon them, they are miserable, because it is not their kind of happiness. Good also must be regarded as a term highly relative in relation to the changing patterns of civilization. Many things that were considered good long ago are no longer considered good. Things that were regarded as evil 50 years ago are now accepted as commonplace and not to be the cause of very much uh, unhappiness or worry. In the Middle Ages, a man was good if he drew his sword quickly and killed the other man first. If he did not accept the challenge to a duel, he was not good. He was a coward. He lost all community standing. Today, this is no longer the case. In, all, in different periods of time, various values men have sought after have been regarded as the greatest good. Even today, there are millions of human beings industriously striving after various good things that are meaningful to them. Others have no share in this meaning, and each feels that others are wasting their time. So good becomes a fulfillment of our own natures, that which brings to us the greatest sense of achievement, of accomplishment, of integrity. Uh, these are decisions that the person has to make in himself, for we have learned that there is no very common rule that we can apply to all of them. Thus we can uh, approach perhaps good now in a still more philosophic way to try to understand the problem of good and evil. Suppose we affirm for the moment that the universe is right. There are people who are reluctant to do this, but they've never been able to make a very good case to the contrary. But assuming for the moment that the universe is essentially right, that the power, whatever it may be, that regulates the universe is essentially a proper power that the universe, having been created by a power capable of creating it, and being maintained by that power which is obviously capable of maintaining it, that this universal project, so to say, being under the dominion of an absolute authority, that the moral issue rests as to the integrity of that absolute authority. Most persons have assumed that, er, that absolute authority to be God. And this God is therefore the highest possible quality of being, a being which is perfect in all qualities, attributes, conceivable and beyond human conception. That this power is deficient in nothing. And this power must also possess within itself the envisionment of purpose. Whatever it is that exists, either exists for a reason or for no reason. If it arises within the nature of an omniscient being, then this plan of things, so slowly, industriously, arduously projected through time and space, this incredible unfoldment of existence beyond even the imagination of the greatest astronomer or physicist. This tremendous project must arise from some power capable of causing it. Even if we wish to assume that this process is continuous forever, then the continuing forever process has to have these attributes. And there is no reason to assume, even by the most materialistic sophistication, that the power that is capable of creating so vast and magnificent a 
projection, that this power is not also purposed or purposeful in some way. This massive production has to be going somewhere. It is inconceivable to assume that any power intelligent enough to create this pattern would at the same time permit it to die out in space in complete futility. We cannot assume that this creating power is merely a child fashioning something in a sandbox of atoms. There seems to be every indication that whatever this power is is far wiser than we are, and man has never been slow to advance the merits of his own wisdom. So uh, how can we assume uh, that deity uh, can be completely without purpose? Now, if we assume purpose, we are forced to assume that purpose is achieved through process. Everything that is happening is happening in some way in relation to the fulfillment of purpose. If this entire structure, down to the smallest electron, is in a perfect harmonic pattern, held together by irrefutable and unbreakable laws, then we must have progress, process, unfoldment, ideation, evolution, whatever we want to call it. This tremendous pattern is moving from somewhere to somewhere. It is moving from something to something. It is moving from some condition to some other condition. We can observe this motion in part. Enough of it, however, to give us considerable security in affirming that there is more of this same motion. This means that if we are willing to accept that this plan indicates some kind of sovereign intelligence, that this sovereign intelligence knows what it is doing. In the Hindu thinking, of course, this sovereign intelligence fills all space as Brahma. It extends to the ultimate duration of time and eternity. The infinite absolute which contains the entire galaxy of all conceivable created systems in space. This incredible immensity permeates all existence with its own nature. And this is its own nature is life, law, intellect, energy. Is this tremendous nature is the source of the infinite variety of manifestations that arise within it. Now, if this nature is the absolute and is the ultimate creating power carried to infinity, if this nature is sufficient in itself, inevitable and immutable of itself, the creator of its own laws, and at the same time is unique being the only of itself that can exist, then it becomes reasonably obvious that this power will not create an arch enemy. This power with a purpose is not going to fashion a frustration for that purpose. There is no need for it. There is no conception that requires it. There is nothing in the processes of nature that reveal that this happened. Actually, it is impossible, as the Hindu really tells us, for there to be a hell within the body of God. And as there is nothing outside of the body of God, and every creature that exists is part of deity, the concept of damnation, damnation must mean that deity damns himself. And this is not conceivable. The second alternative to this is that the universe with all the attributes which we have already mentioned does not rise from a being, but arises from a complex 
of forces, of energies. That the source of the existence is not an entity, but a process itself. Uh, this, however, changes none of the inevitable dependencies upon this process. Whether we wish to consider deity to be a being, or to be an infinite energy, or an infinite mind, or an infinite life without personalized or individualized existence. We are still in exactly the same position. But whatever this is, is obviously capable of an orderly procedure, a purposeful procedure, a procedure arising in processes, and a, pr a procedure that must lead ultimately to the survival of the energies which are involved in it. We then come to the same essential point again. The, uh, the basic realization that behind all existence there has to be purpose, there has to be plan, there has to be some kind of an unfoldment or an ideation, or a projection, or a motion in time from past to future, and this motion has to be orderly. It is orderly, it always has been. To have this uh, basic concept leaves us then no moral choice but to assume that whatever this power is, is right because it is inevitable. Right now simply stands for obedience to the pattern, whatever this pattern may be. There can be no right contrary to the eternal purpose. For anything that is contrary to an eternal purpose must ultimately be destroyed or must be in some way modified, changed, reformed, or reconditioned by that purpose itself. To carry this one step further then, this right which we sense as existing, which perhaps the scientist is in the best position to understand, because he is working with exactitudes all the time. This right we can call an exactitude. We can also say that certain laws, once noticed and considered, examined, researched, may be known to proceed according to their own natures to infinity. There is no evidence that these laws suddenly change their minds. So that we have the basic concept here that this infinite purpose, whatever it may be, has to be right because there can be no other purpose. We cannot rebel and walk out of it because there is no place to go. If we walk forever, we could never reach the end of this purpose, this plan. If we had all the spaceships in time, in time and imagination and could go on for millions of light years into infinity, we would still not escape any part of this essential plan. We cannot defy it because no gnat floating in a sunbeam can defy the sun itself. We cannot in any way create an adequate conspiracy against it because if we could unite all the wits of 10,000 solar systems, it would mean nothing. Whatever this thing is, is. And because this thing that is, is also the very center and substance of ourselves, all rebellion against it is merely intellectual will gathering. There can be no rebellion. This thing, then, whatever this pattern must be and is, has to be right by its own absolute autocracy. It is not a government that we can overthrow. It is not a government which we can attack or assail. There is no use picketing it. There is nothing we can do about it. And we have never yet discovered that there was any need to do anything about it. 
This government has never been an obviously oppressive autocracy. It has never done anything, as far as we really know, to hurt us. And there are no theologies that will stand up and declare that God has injured anything. So there seems to be no particular way in which we can get out of the fact that rightness is demonstrated eternally by the archetype or pattern of existence as it is. This leaves creation uh, in a situation in which assuredly any natural process has to be according to right. It has to be according to law of some kind. Not man-made, but universal law. And universal law is the will of the plan asserting itself. And by means of universal law, the creation is governed as by a great legislative system. The, the, the answer then also presents itself is that this lawfulness has to be the final symbol of right. Now having a right that exists in a condition in which there is no wrong, because this particular kind of right has no shadow, it has no negative polarity. This right is an infinitely and forever unfolding process. If this right is, therefore, lawful, eternal, inevitable, and if its motions will continue for hundreds of billions of years unchanging in their resolution to attain their own ends, then it must inevitably follow that if this rightness is right, its objectives are right, and its processes are right, we have no evidence whatever that this right will use evil means to attain right ends. We have no reason to assume that this right assumes that the ends justify the means and therefore require any compromise of principles. We have to assume that the infinite as deity, as truth, as reality, as integrity, must be forever honorable. Under such conditions, can anything that is wrong, can anything that is essentially bad, happen? This is a very large question. For if anything bad can happen, then we have to assume that there is a contrary force having a vitality and nature of its own which can resist the operations of the universal agent. Most philosophical systems decline to accept this. A few religions have, but the great moral systems have not been willing to regard such a probability. Rather, they have taken this position, that in the enfoldment of this universal plan, an infinite variety of lives have emerged from the great seed life, which is the totality. These lives are in various degrees of growth and development. These lives represent parts and fragment, fragments of this greater life. But this greater life does not come into manifestation all at once. We're not sure that the great pattern of things has even been revealed in space as yet. We are somewhat inclined to suspect that this pattern is growing. That whether we believe it or not, space is constantly enlarging in some mysterious superdimensional way. Therefore, that this infinite being moves into expression through a series of waves, a series of great releases of life which are periodically released all through space. 
just as the seasons produce various kinds of flowers and plants. And for all these there is a period of seed, of growth, of blossom, and of fruit. So in space there is a constant coming forth of existences. And these existences uh, represent various degrees of the revelation of the original life pattern. In, the, in Danta and Yoga and other Eastern systems of philosophy, and also among the Greeks, it was assumed that these seed lives becoming embodied must evolve through embodiment. Part of nature's program is the evolution of the species. We see this evolution in part around us in the growth and development of the mineral, vegetable, animal, and human kingdoms. We do not assume for a moment that these are all the kingdoms, but they are all that our own perceptions make possible for us to understand. We therefore assume that these kingdoms are ladders, and that these ladders in turn represent degrees of revelation or revealment of submerged life principles, that in these various creations the life seed is unfolding in various degrees, and that as these lives unfold they gain various attributes until in man we have the maximum number of these revealed attributes. Man is capable, therefore, of existing as a mineral, a vegetable, an animal, and a human being. As a mineral, he has a physical body, as the mineral has. As a plant, he has growth and reproduction. As an animal, he has emotion and sense. And as a human being, he has intellect. Thus man has achieved a certain degree of unfoldment. This degree of unfoldment, however, is not complete. This degree of unfoldment is as yet imperfect. And in the course of his own imperfect unfoldment, he is struggling to gain control of the various instruments which evolution is providing. Wherein evolution provides these instruments and what their ultimate intention is can only be estimated in an abstract way. We can assume, however, that these bodies, faculties, powers, and perceptions of man have a continuing existence in space, and that perhaps long after he has outgrown the need for them, that other forms of life will require them. But man passing through these various levels or degrees of unfoldment comes into various degrees of intelligence. It is not proper to say, perhaps, that the lesser kingdoms are devoid of intelligence. There is a great deal of evidence that even the most humble forms of life do have some kind of psychic existence. Nor is there any reason to assume that any of these lesser forms feel themselves underprivileged. Each is fulfilling its own destiny with the degree of consciousness which it possesses, and for each of them the universe is as large as can be properly conceived of by that particular form of life. So we come now to man, who exists as a partly evolved creature. In the midst of this vast structure, he is more aware, probably, of this structure than any of the lesser kingdoms, at least of its outer nature. It is quite possible that these other kingdoms are more aware of its inner nature. Perhaps intuitively they perceive more than man does. But man, moving bluntly into objective relationship with things, perceives the universe around him and senses his own relationship to it in part. Now man in his own development has developed this psychomental organism. It was necessary for him to do so. This is part of his natural growth. But at various levels in growth we come upon the inconveniences of growing. Children experience these. It is no fun to simply grow up in this world anymore, from infancy to adulthood. It is full of pressures and problems. 
and man in his, man in his larger growing up process passes through infancy, childhood, adolescence, young maturity, and finally perhaps a fuller maturity. But these processes of growth all require adjustment. And man's evolution requires perpetual adjustment between himself and the pattern in which he exists. Just as young people are rebellious against society, so man in his evolution passes through these periods of rebellion. Rebellion which arises from his own sense of maturing intellect come in, in conflict with the real purposes of existence. Buddha therefore tells us that we have taken this tremendous plan which we do not understand and we have tried to interpret it. We had to try because this very plan is in us. We have to try because we have part of the energy of the plan striving within ourselves to reach out and grasp its own import. But we are seriously handicapped. Our growth is not yet sufficient to bring us into the adjustment which we want. We are growing in a perfectly natural and completely uncomfortable way, which is the way it was intended. Man, however, has in some instances been unnecessarily opaque in his attitudes. He has made mistakes that he did not need to make. He has made them because of the conflict between the sense of destiny in himself and the inability to release this sense of destiny in a reasonable concept within himself. Man senses his relationship to the infinite, but he is unable to make this sensing take on a fully rational characteristic. He just does not have as yet the skill to do it with. Man, therefore, not understanding and being a little too proud to admit this, set up in the very beginning of his existence certain rules, certain attitudes, certain plans, certain patterns for himself. We have to realize that he did this at the worst possible time. It would be like asking a newborn babe to decide on what college it's going to. Man was set in certain patterns before he had the realization to know what these patterns meant. And drifting down through time, he has permitted himself to pres pre preserve or perpetuate these patterns. He has never had quite the courage to break them. He has never been willing uh, to admit basic error and seek for a reorganization of his relationships with the infinite. Gradually, out of his own uh, arrogance, so to say, out of his own perpetual adolescence, out of the inevitable spirit of the beatnik that has been in him since the beginning, man has decided that he was qualified to take over the universe that he was qualified to interpret it, that he was qualified to say whether there was a God or whether there was not a God. And he even went so far as to think that his affirmation or denial of deity had any effect whatsoever. He decided that if he wished to relegate deity to limbo, deity was going to go there. But the man who was constantly doing the relegating was the one who landed in limbo. As far as we can find out, deity was never much affected by any of this. As an old American Indian said, the moon is not disturbed by the bearing of wolves. And this is much our problem. We have taken the universe apart, put it together again, intellectually at least, to our own satisfaction. And like the autopsy surgeon, we've never found a soul in it. Therefore, we assume there isn't any. We assume all these things. So we then decide in our own way just what kind of a universe we are willing to live in and start issuing automata. We set up our own patterns of education, our patterns of government, 
our arts and our sciences, we declare what is good and what is bad, what is truth and what is error. And we create great man-made institutions to perpetuate, strengthen, and preserve our own opinions. Out of all this tremendous energy that we have expended in the process of taking over the rulership of things, we have come into this conflict with existence which we call the struggle of good and evil. Good and evil, therefore, is nothing more or less than man's own relationship to things that never change. Man having ambitions uh, calls any natural force that frustrates these ambitions evil. It has no bearing upon the fact of the matter. The individual then says that he wants to be comfortable and happy. Anything that makes him uncomfortable or unhappy is evil. Furthermore, he can see no reason why it would be permitted, and if he ran the universe, he would take care of it immediately. But he doesn't run the universe, so the thing goes on just exactly as it did before. The problem that faced Buddha in his philosophy was therefore not to explain why man was right, or go into an lengthy and elaborate debate as to which men were the most right. His great problem was to prove that the universe was right. And in order to prove the universe was right, he had to prove that the universe was without error in its own structure. That everything that happened had to be right. In this way, and this way only, could he get away from the conflict of good and evil. If things are right as they are, whether we like it or not, we are no longer required, therefore, to assume that what we do not like is evil. All we have to do is to recognize the unfoldment of a great merit system in space. So Buddha advanced the concept of karma as the solution to punishment and reward. The concept of karma was a law recognized as existing in space. God did not reward. Devils did not punish. Act rewarded and punished itself according to its own nature. And the fact that act did punish and reward itself was a supreme proof of good, if we want to assume uh, the polarity of good at the moment. Evil would be if these laws did not operate. And as they do operate, and always have, and so far as we can imagine, always will, there can be no evil, because evil would be unlawfulness. It would be contrary to the plan. It would be rebellion against the infinite. And everything that occurs around man is not rebellion but fulfillment. So the individual says to himself, as he frequently does, I am very grateful for my success. I have been promoted. I am now the general manager of the Southwest Branch. This is something I have always wanted to be. So he has now fulfilled. To him this is good. This is reward. But now what happens? Having achieved this position, what he calls good is now a new challenge upon his own integrity. In order to justify and sustain this advancement, he must have capacities, he must have abilities. Furthermore, if he has received advancement in economics, if he has a larger salary, he will now be tempted to extravagances. He will find new ways of hurting himself with this good that has apparently happened to him. He will find his family more extravagant, his friends more demanding, his responsibilities greater, 
and his desire to fill them less. Because now he has so many personal things which his new position will permit him to afford that he begrudges the time that he must spend on the job. Little by little, this benefit turns into a punishment. And, and perhaps in the midst of his success, he drops dead at 47. <coughs> Therefore, what was the truth of the matter? Was the, his promotion good? It was not good if he was not big enough to handle it. And because he was not able to handle it, and because he did not discipline himself, this good turned into negative karma. He caused his own ultimate self-destruction by the misuse of authority which had been vested in him by advancement. He couldn't handle it. If he therefore has something handed to him which he cannot properly administer, it is not good, even though he thinks it is. So all of these problems turn upon a, a very deep and involved series of factors. One thing that nature is demanding of us all the time is that the individual shall achieve victory over the situations in which he finds himself. Victory for man, because he is an intellectually integrated creature, always must involve self-discipline. Self-discipline is the one thing which bestows the courage of right decision. It causes the person to have the strength to obey the best part of his own nature. Without self-discipline, there is bound to be compromise. Wherever compromise comes in, karma comes in. Wherever self-discipline is great enough, to preserve the integrity of the individual, his advancements are beneficial and produce good. Unfortunately, however, the more good he enjoys, the greater securities or privileges society bestows, the less self-discipline he has. The ancient historians, looking back over the history of the race, therefore have decided that periods of prosperity were the greatest evils that ever befell mankind, and periods of adversity were the most beneficial. This is exactly the opposite, the way we want it to be. But unfortunately, nobody asked us how we wanted it to be. We wanted, as most creatures have always wanted, to follow the natural law of inertia. If the consciousness in man departs entirely, he falls flat on his face. He is unconscious. He is dead. At least he is in a horizontal position. And as far as endeavor is concerned, we have always wanted to be in a horizontal position. <laughs> we have regarded work as a penalty and leisure as a reward. We have regarded anything that challenged us and make, made us grow to be an adversity. Everything that left us alone, like the dragon in Siegfried, and let us sleep, was regarded as a great benefit. The whole matter was completely reversed because man decided what he wanted. Man's idea of the perfect universe is the one in which he does nothing and has everything. This is his plan. But for some reason it doesn't jibe with the eternal program. So the individual locks himself in a desperate effort to convince God that deity is wrong and man is right. He prays, he makes offerings, he creates talisman and magic charms, anything to find some power, celestial or infernal, uh, that will enable him to do as he pleases and be happy. He's never made it work yet. And many have tried. 
We would hear more reports, except those who have tried have also, most of them, departed from us and are no longer very articulate. But always, the human being has his own ideas of what he wants, but they are not the ideas of the plan that fashioned him. This plan wants certain things done, and it has a simple process of obediences and disobediences, the obediences rewarded and the disobediences punished. From this there is absolutely no escape. There are no justifications, there are no exonerations. As the individual sows, so shall he reap. It is this little matter of reaping the things we do not want to reap that we call evil. It is also the matter of reaping those things that are right, that are worthy of good harvest, that we call good. And the nature of us being a strange mix mixture of good and evil, our lives are in many a strange mixture of fortune and misfortune. One day we enjoy a little well-earned good. The next day we spoil it and begin to suffer from an equally well-earned evil. But we just do not like to accept it that way. We do not want to face this problem, that evil is really nothing more than our own disobedience coming home to roost. Evil is corruption caused by creatures capable of mental decision. Now, it's obvious that uh, all these intricate patterns of things cannot work out with any, within a given period of years. So in the Eastern philosophies, both Hindu and Buddhist, and also among the Platonists and Pythagoreans among the Greeks, the doctrine of reincarnation had to be introduced. It was through the concept of metempsychosis that the long-range pattern of things could work out. It was by this pattern also that the apparent inconsistencies of life, the unmerited successes and failures, incidents and accidents that did not appear to be consistent with present known conditions. It was by, these, by this law that these were interpreted. Obviously, the individual evolving down through time uh, was not beginning now any more than the great universe of which he is a part is beginning now. The world does not begin when man is born, nor does it end when he dies. Nor is there any reason to assume that man begins or ends, merely with the appearance or disappearance of his physical body. If he is part of an eternal process, then he is also eternal. But in the process of his own growth and development, he has built a very intricate complex of factors. He has become a karmic syndrome in himself. And this syndrome consists of a strange, involved pattern of right and wrong, of good and evil, of creation and destruction, of intelligence and ignorance, of uh, appetite, desire, passion, lust, whatever we wish to consider to be the total background of the total person. He has evolved from periods prehistoric. He has been part of all the empires that rose and fell in the dawn of time. He has shared in every iniquity since the beginning of history. But he has also been present in those wonderful moments of great human aspiration. He may have failed completely in integrity in one life and achieved a great victory in another pushed on by the pressure of his own unfinished business, he arrives at his present state 
a curious combination of assets and liabilities. He comes into this world perhaps having earned a secure childhood, but at the same time he has not earned a secure mature life. He has earned the right to have a good mother, but he has not earned the right to have a good wife. He has earned the right to have a good wife, but he has not earned the right to have good children. Each of these patterns has to work out. And in the Jataka tales, which are a Buddhist fable of the previous embodiments of the great teacher, it's pointed out that our lives are combinations of finished and unfinished business. Most of the business being, however, not completely finished. Our morality at a given time may be sufficient to meet the challenge of the moral problem of that time, but 10,000 years from now it will not be adequate. The individual may have gained the right to a good education, but never had the integrity to hold a job. He may have had the natural simplicity of a very good peasant and be born in this world with an extraordinary measure of potential for happiness and very little potential for success. These patterns are part of destiny. They are earned by the individual. Not one of them is the result of deity pointing a finger. Not one of them is the result of the devil under the pew coaxing the person to become a delinquent. He doesn't need coaxing. He's doing a good job of it all by himself. Why do we have to be led into temptation when most of us already know the way? The individual has this combination of factors. If he was all good or all bad, it would be easy enough to understand him. If he was all good, we would say he was a saint descended from heaven and hope he will go back and not bother us. If he was all evil, we would know that he was a devil raised from the pit and we would be in a haste to put him back there. But no one is like that. Some have tremendous predominance of evil and curse the generations in which they live. Others have great predominance of good and bless the centuries that remember their names. But the majority of persons are a kind of bit of this and a bit of that. And nearly always what they are is not quite enough to secure them against the problem of their time. Actually, re-embodiment always also means a shift of scenery. The individual moves into another psychic pattern. While he has been out of embodiment, generations of embodied beings have made certain social changes in material life. The individual who went out of embodiment at the time of the American Revolution and comes back at this time, comes back into a very different world. Therefore, he may have been adequate to that world in which he previously lived, but he was born here with immediate need for further adjustments. He may, however, have the essential integrity to make these adjustments, at least in part, or he may not have sufficient stamina to make them. If he is not able to constructively adjust, then he will pass through certain painful circumstances. These painful circumstances will either assist him to adjust or will so-called break him. If he is not strong enough to meet the circumstances of the day, he may become an alcoholic and then this present cycle in delirium tremens. He may become a narcotics addict. Anything can happen to him if he is too weak to face the challenge of his time. But nature, because of its different perspective to this whole situation, seems cruel to us because it does not permit all these weak people 
to be happy, safe, secure, prosperous, and go on to eternal glory. But if we think for a moment, we realize that nature could not do this and still be just and be worthy of the admiration of any thoughtful person. Nature cannot be weak. Nature cannot be sentimental. Nature must differentiate between love and sentiment, just as every parent has to make this differentiation. The spoiled child is no credit to the parent and will turn upon the parent. Discipline is essential. Now, if as many people believe, particularly materialists, the failure here goes down to the earth never to rise again. Then to the materialist this seems to be very cruel. But to make it cruel, the materialist has to be inconsistent with himself. Because if this man does go down to absolute oblivion, neither he nor anybody else will ever know whether he succeeded or failed. Therefore he will not be lingering on in the memory of his own failure. But the materialist cannot be right in this, because if he is right, then the plan is wrong, and it is better to change the viewpoint of man and preserve integrity. So we have to assume that in the great pattern of things, the individual who comes into this world to learn has learning as his objective, whether he knows it or not. If he can learn with a certain amount of joy, if he can accept his lessons with grace and dignity of spirit, this is good. This is the way it ought to be. But lots of people won't let it be this way. If, however, this person is born a rebel, rebels to the end, dies in bitterness, or completely overwhelmed by life, trying, tries to revenge himself upon life by disintegrating his own nature, which is a common psychological problem, then what he has done is to create a tremendous karmic pressure. This individual is continually building a situation against which, which he must ultimately rebel. The fact that he passes out of this life as unrepentant is of no interest to nature. It doesn't care whether he repents or does not repent. The only thing that nature is concerned with is that this being shall come to its own spiritual maturity. This is the only problem. And in this system of thinking, no one can fail. Some can delay it a little longer than others. Some can play truant longer than others. But in this process, even though the individual actually rebels, rejects the lesson, lives as badly as he can, and becomes a criminal and degenerate for a hundred lives, ultimately nature is going to force him into line. The gradual mounting pressure of his own bad karma will ultimately force him to change his ways. It will be unendurable to him. And one day he must open his eyes and say, why has this happened to me? And when he does this, he begins to grow. Now the situation is usually not as desperate as this, however. Because even where there is a heavy load of rejection of existence, there are also areas of acceptances. The individual whom we term bad is seldom all bad. He has his virtues and his vices, and he also has the vices of his virtues and the virtues of his vices. He is a complex being. Therefore, in his karmic pattern, there are things with which he can face the next life with hope, but there will be a very, very heavy burden. One of the heaviest burdens that the individual has to bring back with him into life is the burden of a bad disposition based usually upon a psychosis that he is the victim of unfairness. The longer the person, therefore, rejects the law, life after life, 
the more he is going to come back feeling himself the victim of evil because he has refused to see the facts because he has closed his mind to his own responsibilities and has rejected the karma which is his natural destiny he comes back into life embittered uh, suffering from various delusions about himself he becomes miserable by uh, lack of simple courtesies, kindlinesses, and gentlenesses. He finds it so easy to dislike and so difficult to forgive. This is simply due to the fact that he has never accepted the law. When a person comes back so uh, drenched in this peculiar situation, he can also be a tremendous harm apparently to other people and this is where the point of evil takes on the one angle which most people have been unable to cope with namely why a person who is not responsible for another individual's difficulties should be burdened by them a family with one extremely difficult person the whole family brought to tragedy by that person this is again, however, a comic situation. This family is not what it appears to be, a group of martyrs. This group of martyrs is actually a group of entities, each one of which is carrying its own comic syndrome. If the individuals themselves have transcended this situation, they either are not in it or find from it a cause of further personal growth. They are not afflicted in vain, even where a difficulty seems to be beyond their control. Nature confronts a complex pattern of this kind with a whole group of comic possibilities. The members of the family who are unhappy are these unhappy people themselves well integrated? Is this unhappiness taking, or taking place in the lives of clear thinking, better understanding, wisely equipped members of a family? Not usually. It is usually occurring in a family that does not even know what it's all about, that can only suffer. They can only wonder, and if it's pious, do a little praying for release. But this is not the actual answer to the situation at all. The members of the family were perhaps drawn into this pattern by a common comic, comic problem. But each one of them, in the course of association, has helped to make it worse. Each one of them has failed in the various attitudes and reactions which might have solved something. One has taken a negative patient attitude which demanded no courage, no discrimination, but simply permitted continuous suffering to itself. Another individual humored too long until they lost control. Another member of the family would have stepped out long ago, but they wanted the estate of this unpleasant person and were going to hang on to the bitter end. One after another, these persons caused this situation to become an instrument for the working out of their own karma. To some, it meant patience to an impatient person. To others, it meant strength to a person not strong enough to have that strength and therefore required to develop it if possible. To some it meant honesty, not to cling to a dishonest situation even though it was comfortable. It meant that each of these persons was also involved in a karmic pattern. And if in that karma anywhere there was one person who understood through the situation 
whose inner consciousness was great enough in that particular situation to understand it, that person was not injured. That person had the insight to know or see or sense the reality. And as Socrates said, the only man who can insult me is a good man, and good men don't insult anyone. So that there was uh, a certain protection in this problem. Wisdom would help us to carry. Insight makes it possible for us to meet responsibilities and bear them if necessary with continual enrichment to understanding by right attitude within ourselves. So this little complex of situations really breaks down to ways of getting at various angles in the karma of 10, 12, 20 people, each one reacting according to his strength or his weakness. If he reacted according to his strength, he began to solve the matter. If he reacted according to his weakness, he was submerged and lost in it. But each of these patterns was fulfilling itself. The pattern could not have touched them had they not needed the lesson. It could not have operated in their lives had they not deserved it. So that each individual is in a wonderful way guarded by his own deserts. Now we might want to wonder, perhaps, how it is that the, a mysterious universal power can set someone down in the midst of a particular family and very carefully measure all this karmic circumstance to make sure that nobody is cheated of anything. This seems worse than the old story of the uh, archangel keeping the books of judgment. It sounds like a very heavy task. But there's no task at all because it doesn't make any difference where any of these people are sat down. It doesn't make any difference at all. Wherever they are placed, their reaction upon the karmic needs of those around them will reveal where the lessons lie. There's no way of escaping it. It may be that this individual is placed in a group of people, all of whom are so self-centered that the an unpleasant person can't hurt any of them. But this unpleasant person, by relationship, can inconvenience them in some other way, perhaps financially, so that some weakness in them will be hurt. Whatever is the area in which their own karma requires this experience, they will accept the experience, or at least go through it. They can't avoid it because the energies, the patterns, the symbols within themselves will come out challenged by the environmental condition. And it's as though you were sorting things in some kind of a mechanical sorting device. That which you need stands out and hits you. That which has no part of your need goes past. You never know it happened. But always, in every one of these combinations, some chord of karma is struck. And it is always the chord of what you need. There can never be injustice. And anybody can be put down anywhere and create a situation which will help somebody else to grow. Now, it may be an unpleasant way of helping, but the growth is inevitable. And that is nature's essential end. Therefore, what we commonly call good and bad merely refers, in, in the deepest essence of the matter, to strength and weakness in ourselves. Attainment in ourselves is of itself good. And the productions of that attainment in life will be benevolent. By these attainments, we achieve value. We come to be known and appreciated by persons of attainment. Our own attainments give us the grace and the dignity and the courage and the quietude to handle our lives in an orderly, gentle manner. We are not going to cause trouble for ourselves. Having attained a certain level, we are not going to poison our own natures with our hates and our difficulties and our antagonisms. We are not going to do any of these things. 
Therefore, our achievements, our attainments, are going to make life good for us. But as we cannot have attained in everything, as even Buddha himself had to pay his last karmic debt on his last day on earth, so it is not assumed that any life can be so completely perfect in karma that no adversity will arise, no problem will present itself, no new application will be needed. But the person whose karmic good is strong in him will have greater facilities out of his own integrities to meet the circumstances that arrive. arise. He will accept his duties as opportunities. He will bear them with insight and patience. And even though he may go through temporary periods of inadequacy, he will triumph in the end. If ever this person comes in with a very heavy negative load in which the achievements have not been great and uh, his cash destiny is so impending that he can no longer ev evade some of the economic debts that have been pressing perhaps upon him for generations and ages, this individual finds himself in serious difficulties. To him, his own nature makes the world in which he lives react upon him in the term of negative karma. But this evil which he attributes to others is really the inadequacy in himself, his inability to achieve reasonable self-discipline. Therefore, he becomes a victim. Because he wishes to make an unreasonable profit, he invests his money in an unreasonable enterprise and loses it. He calls the other man a thief, but the real fact was he hoped to be the thief first. In, in his own selfishness, blinded him and made him the victim of his own cupidity. And in every way, these reactions come. We blame the other person. He is bad. And somewhere behind all this badness is the father of badness, the devil. But this real father of all unhappiness and all misery is simply the spiritual ignorance in ourselves. It is the fact that we are unable to meet the circumstance with enough skill. The one way, of course, that the mystics have always approached this is that if man is not sure, if he cannot be completely wise, if he is not truly strong enough to meet all the challenge, then he has to fall back upon the elements of the simple virtues, such as faith and hope. He has to follow the admonitions of the great teachers, to do good to them that outrageously use him, to turn the other cheek, to forgive his enemy quickly. All these do not seem to mean much. In fact, they seem entirely contrary to our purposes. But when we do succeed in returning good for evil, we have performed an act of good in ourselves. We may be the victim of this other person's conspiracy, but if we contributed nothing negative to the event, but held to the best principles that we know or believe, and when we cannot be assured of exactly what to do, we do that which is gracious, kind, gentle, honorable, helpful. We are then building into ourselves a better karmic pattern. If we build in forgiveness, we shall be forgiven. Because not, be, not actually because of the fact of forgiveness, but because the whole of forgiveness is also a mental attitude. But sometime when we need that attitude ourselves, it will be forthcoming if we have ourselves used that attitude. So everything that we do that is toward graciousness, toward good as we know good, this strengthens the good karmic pattern and makes available new units of helpfulness when we need them. 
Thus the syndrome itself is forever changing. And in all these changes, all new good and all new error fit into the pattern to produce the next sequence of events. But the main thing for us to always bear in mind, if we can, is that good is two things. First of all, good is the good in us as character, rightness. And good in the second place is the harvest in our environment of the rightness in ourselves. Evil is primarily the ulterior motives of our own minds and emotions. And evil in the world is the, it was made up of the reactions of society to the stimulation of the evil in ourselves. Therefore, good and evil really are our own standards of existence reflected back upon us by the society of which we are a part. If we can really understand this, we will no longer allow ourselves to evade personal responsibility on the ground that some imp of darkness is tempting us. The only imp of darkness was, that was ever necessary is the imp in us, which has been tempting us since before Eden. This imp of darkness is our own self-centeredness, our own selfishness, and our own desperate hope that we can do something wrong without paying for it. And as long as we nurse this joyous thought, we will be paying for things that we do not know we have done. And uh, philosophy helps us to clear this situation, and perhaps this will make the problem of good and evil a little bit easier for us to bear as the mixed karma flows in on us each day. Thank you very much.